call for us to deny ourselves and our own desires because they contradict God's command, like the Garden of Eden. And yet, and yet God has shown himself to be unbelievably loving as he has in Christ sacrificed his comfort for our good. God is worthy of trust. Throughout creation, authority is an expression of God's own character. David's final words are a beautiful reflection of this, of authority's divine nature. In 2 Samuel 23, when David writes, When one rules over men in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings the grass from the earth. Authority well exercised blesses those underneath it. This is as true in the home as it is in the nation, and it's as true in the church as it is in marriage. Very practically, pastors need to know for which Christians will be giving an account to God. In our own congregation, we may have seven or eight hundred sitting there on a Sunday morning, but only five or six hundred of those have made themselves known to us. Only they, the members, have told us their understanding of the gospel their experience of God's grace, their commitment. Only they have pledged themselves to support us and to care for us and to love us. Now, some of the other attenders of the church may, in fact, do those things, or some of those things, but for some reason they've not told us that they do and that they will, and so we don't know how to pray for them. We, we don't know that we should count on them. We don't know how to care for them. Practically, membership functions to facilitate loving obedience to the pastor's God has placed there and to facilitate loving care among all the members. A fifth one, the glory of love. The glory of love. When Saul was going to persecute Christians in Damascus, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And as I was observing in the meeting this morning, Christ didn't say there, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting Christians? He said, why are you persecuting me? He so identifies himself with the church. Now, of course, we know that it was God himself who set up the church. To set up the church to bring glory to God by our lives. To teach the creation the truth about his own character. If Jesus is the image of the invisible God, how do we see Jesus today? Well, Jesus isn't to be worshipped through physical icons or images. We have no account of him teaching his disciples to draw or sketch or sculpt. We have books they wrote, but no images they made remaining for our adoration. In fact, the earliest image of Christ that I know of was found in the catacombs. It was not written by a Christian. It was drawn by a non-Christian mocking Christian. Put a little cross and a stick figure on it with an ass's head, saying, Aleximinos worships his God. Now, that's the beginning of icons that I know of. John of Damascus, some centuries later, said that to deny icons was to deny the incarnation. And in his day, some people who opposed the use of icons did deny the incarnation. But those who went before John of Damascus neither denied the incarnation nor used icons. The point of the incarnation was never the mere physical appearance of Christ. It was the life of flesh and blood that he lived out. Christ probably couldn't be identified in a photograph of him and the twelve disciples. No golden disc behind his head. Lacquered finish. Unless you believe from Isaiah 53 that it means his appearance is actually that he was ugly. Maybe then you could pick him out. I don't think that's what Isaiah was talking about. But now if it became a moving picture then I think you could immediately tell which one the Son of God was by the way he would give himself in loving service for others. Don't misunderstand me. I don't mean to deride our desire for the visible. People say this is a visual age. Friends, every age is a visual age. We are made by our very nature to crave the immediacy of sight. We naturally desire to see God immediately, but that blessing was taken from us at the fall. We live in salvation history not in the era of the eye, but of the ear. Now, one day, that glorious immediacy of seeing God will be restored to us. That's the climax of the Bible. Uh, That's when professors and pastors get to stop doing this kind of stuff that I'm doing right now. 
And that will be a glorious day. We find the consummation in Revelation 22, 4. They shall see God. This, this is a wonderful hope. Until then, God is made most visible, it seems, not in two-dimensional paintings, but in the lives lived out in your local church. For church membership to display the glory of God, the glory of His nature. It is His plan for His goodness and His love to be seen and to bring Him praise through the membership of our local church. Such an exalted conclusion to such a pedestrian topic. Maybe it's not quite so pedestrian. Finally, let's get really down and dirty for the pastors here. Twelve steps to regain meaningful membership. Here it is. Number one, regularly proclaim the gospel in your preaching. Be certain to include clear statements about the nature of God, of human sin, of God's provision in Christ, of his substitutionary death and bodily resurrection. Be clear in calling for repentance and faith, even in the way you explain what repentance looks like. You can make it clear that people who don't give themselves in loving commitment to each other have no reason to think that they have given themselves in loving commitment to God. Define what it means to be a Christian again and again in provocative ways that cause complacent evangelicals to obey Paul's command to examine yourselves in 2 Corinthians 13. Number two, use your church's statement of faith or church covenant if you have one. With membership in a congregation comes responsibility. The statements of what that congregation together believes and how they will live are important. They are a clear ground of unity, a tool of teaching, a fence against the worldly who would erase such distinctions and against the divisive who would narrow them. Number three, require attendance at membership classes before admitting someone into membership in a congregation. It is a loving thing to present carefully the expectations that others will have of them and what they in turn can expect from the congregation. This is an opportunity to teach carefully through the statement of faith or if you have a church covenant through it before you would ask them to sign it. You can also explain membership like we're doing here. You can go through the history of Christianity, of your own denomination, even of your own particular congregation. It's a good time, too, to orient them to the practical nuts and bolts of how your own local church does its weekly and daily work. Number four, require an interview after they have been through the membership classes, but before they come to be members of the congregation. In the past, Christians have conducted such membership interviews by a committee of members, or deacons, or elders, or even in front of the entire congregation in the heady New England days. It's the practice of our own congregation to do this with an elder and one or two others present, usually staff or intern. And in this interview, ask them to share the gospel with you. Ask them to give you a kind of spiritual autobiography, a detailed account of their own coming to Christ and their discipleship since then. Uh, reiterate the expectations the congregation has for them to be present on the Lord's Day at the Lord's table and if you have them at members meetings. Remind them of their obligations to build relationships as they get to know others. Allow themselves to be known by others, to, to pray for other members, to give financially. So, Stephen, hold up that membership directory I gave you. If you still have that. Oops, somebody has it. Anyway, in our church, for example, we just publish a little booklet like that. And we give one to each member of the congregation. Every week we sort of update them. Cell phone numbers changes, email address changes, uh, and we ask them to pray through at least a page a day in their own personal quiet times. Number five, be very careful about admitting children to membership and the Lord's Supper. The question isn't whether a five or ten-year-old can savingly confess Christ. The question is one of the congregation's ability to discern it. The large number of nominal Christians and rebaptisms in evangelical churches seem to answer the question clearly in the negative. The congregation is not well able to discern this. We are not meant in our local churches to be able to fully distinguish a child's love and trust in God from their love and trust in adults, especially their own parents, and I don't think we're meant to. That love grows up over time as the distinct outlines of the young adult's life come into place as they feel the pull of the world, the flesh, and the devil 
and yet follow Christ. Number six, realize that admission into church membership is an act of the congregation. As I argued earlier, I think this is implied in 2 Corinthians 2, 6. Whether that's done in the most direct manner that we would think of today, like a, a congregational vote, or less direct manner by publicizing the names for a set period of time before, before their membership would sort of take effect, asking for feedback from the congregation, the congregation should be taught that it acts to admit someone into its membership and that apart from death, it acts to release someone from its membership. Number seven, uh, particularly publish a membership directly, like David just held up, in which you have all the members of the church there, the name, picture, physical address, email, phone numbers, publish it regularly, make sure it's accurate, uh, teach members to update their information, and cultivate it as a, use of a, prayer, as a prayer list for the church. Number eight, give active pastoral oversight to the members. Try to make sure that every member is in regular conversation with some elder or some mature Christian in the congregation. Take initiative in trying to know what's going on in members' lives. Lunches, phone calls, emails, book recommendations, conversations after church gatherings are all obvious tools. And the pastors can make structured efforts at pastoral visitation. Uh, one of the things we'll do in our elders' meetings every other week is we'll go through one letter of the alphabet in that membership directory. We'll literally go over every name. Do I know how so-and-so is doing? Do I know how is so-and-so? How is so-and-so? What's going on with this person? We literally walk through each one. Number nine, work to cultivate or to create a culture of discipling in the church. Rather than basically relying on programs and small groups or shared interests, Encourage members deliberately to give themselves in love to each other. Encourage them in their responsibilities to care for each other. Use the staff to facilitate relationships with the goal that everyone in the congregation would develop multiple natural relationships with others in the congregation in which they are being built up as Christians. Help them to understand that their welfare is the business of their brothers and sisters. Number 10. And this would be a way to get yelled at. Limit some activities, events, and areas of service to members. So, for example, there could be a meeting at which only members attend. Make sure that only members can hold office in the church. By, by a meeting only members attend, I don't mean one of the public worship services, just to be clear. Uh, make sure that only members can hold offices in the church. Lead in various kinds of service. Take public roles that would seem to imply the congregation's knowledge and consent. In our congregation, except for evangelistic small groups, we have small groups available for members only. As part of our congregation's discipleship plan, we take responsibility for them, so we need to be able to approve the leaders and settle any difficulties that occur. Now, of course, members are free to start themselves to arrange Bible studies with whatever Christians they want from however many churches. That's their own business. But we, as a church staff and as a church leadership, simply do not take responsibility for training those leaders and filling those groups. We don't rely on them for our own congregation's life. No, God may indeed bless us through them. Eleven, only after membership is recovered, consider reviving the practice of corrective church discipline, including excommunication or exclusion. Too many pastors, you know, get a hold of some of these ideas, and that idea of church discipline just fascinates them. And their guilty conscience weighs heavily upon them. And they begin resolving, I will go back and stand up and take care of this problem. But friends, you don't begin that by beginning with church discipline itself. That would be a jarring transition. One must first take steps to recover a positive understanding and experience of membership. So that were you not to act in church corrective church discipline, it would seem strange. That's the way you reintroduce church discipline into a congregation in that sense. And number 12, finally, and then we'll hand over for, for some Q&A. We must recover something of the grandness of God's plan. Pray for God's blessings on other local evangelical congregations by name in your Sunday morning services. Show that you are not in a sort of sports race with other pastors to build a newer building or have a better better congregational program in this, that, or the other. Remind the congregation of the story 
that we're involved in is greater than our own local congregation.